Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, it is good to be alive on Thursday. We have uh, been feasting in this book of Revelation. We've been revisiting Revelation. All of us here have looked at this book in different uh, stages of life and different stages of our journey as Christians, and we've seen and focused on different parts, but we're revisiting it here over the course of Big Camp, and uh, it's been good to study the Word with one another. As we delve into today's topic, once again, we beg that you would illuminate our understanding. The Spirit's inspired this, but we need to be illuminated to understand it. Help us to that end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's get started. In Matthew chapter 4, we find a remarkable occasion take place. It is called the temptation of Jesus, or Satan tempts Jesus. And I want you to notice this. In verse 3, it says, now when the tempter came to who? Who are we talking about? Come on. Jesus. So that Satan's coming to Jesus. And he says, if you are the son of God, command these stones to be turned to bread. And you know the rest of the story, right? Jesus quotes his own words to the devil because he's quoting scripture and he inspired the scriptures. And at the end of it, in verse 10, it says, then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. And I love the part of underline there. It says, then the devil, say it with me, left him. Amen. The devil left Jesus. And I want you to notice the central issue there in verse 10 was Jesus had it up to here when it got to the issue of worship. Are you with me? All right. So today we are talking about the conflict. We've looked at the people, which is the desire for Jesus. We looked at the, the, or having a desire for Jesus makes us the people. And then we looked at the character of God revealed in his people. Then we looked at the clarity that God gave this people, this last day period of Christian history, to focus on a mission. The mission is tomorrow, what we're going to talk about tomorrow. The message of the mission is tomorrow. But today we're looking at the conflict. There is a conflict that we live in. Whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, is irrelevant. It exists. And Jesus is giving us a little microcosm here that the tempter came to him. Now, if the tempter thinks he can get Jesus, the tempter just is positive he can get you. Are you with me? So Jesus shows us very clearly that when he speaks, the devil, what? Listens. He leaves. All right. When Jesus then begins on his ministry, he comes out of the wilderness, he has the good news, the gospel, and he says, the gospel is the kingdom of God. Then after he says that in verse 17, you get down to chapter, uh, chapter, what are we in? Chapter 4, verse 23, and Jesus starts to do things to demonstrate that he is the promised Messiah. He is delivering, he is redeeming, and what he does is he goes out and does medical missionary work. He heals people, but specifically, I want you to notice what I've underlined there, he casts out devils. I want you to notice, when Jesus showed up, what did the disciples expect him to do? Destroy the Romans. If Jesus had showed up during the Greek Empire, the Jews then would have expected the Messiah to come and deliver them from the Greeks. And before that, it was the Medo-Persians. Before that, it was the Babylonians. They've been waiting for 500 years for the Messiah to come to deliver them. And when Messiah shows up and he says, I am he, Time has been fulfilled. Prophecy is fulfilled. Here I am. I've got good news. His response is not destroy the Romans. His response is I'm going to destroy the devils. Their reign over this place is done. I'm casting them out. Remember, Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand. So something big happened when Jesus showed up. And we're still scratching our heads to understand it all these years later. I want you to notice this. At the, towards the end of Jesus' ministry on earth, when he comes just before the cross, in verse 30, he says, Jesus answered and said, The voice did not come, speaking of the voice of the Father, did not come because of me, but for your sake. Verse 31, Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world has been what? Cast out. Who is he talking about here? Satan himself. So what I want you to see is is that when Jesus shows up, he makes an announcement. The kingdom of heaven is here. It's near. It's at hand, depending on translation. 
And what Jesus is basically saying is, I am the promised king of that kingdom from heaven that's come down. And now what you're going to be introduced to is conflict between two kingdoms fighting it out, so to speak. And so when Jesus does his three and a half years, he gets to the end of it. He says, listen, this enemy who, is, who has usurped authority over this planet, over your planet, over your lives, this ruler, he is cast out because of what this king has done. And the disciples are like, so when are we doing the Romans? They've missed it. And if you were there, you'd miss it too, because you've missed it for 20, 2,023 years. So Jesus comes along and says, listen, I'm going to teach you about this in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit in verse 3, for theirs is what? The kingdom of heaven. Get down to verse 10. He says, blessed are those who are what? Why would the king come and say, hey, so glad I'm here. So glad you're here. So glad you've listened to me and you're following me. But you're going to be persecuted. For what? For righteousness sake. Why would they be persecuted for righteousness sake? Because we're at war. There are two kingdoms fighting it out for the same people in the same territory. And Jesus says, listen, I'm glad you're following me. I'm glad you've signed up to be a follower of, of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But for a while, there's going to be persecution of righteousness in this world. But don't worry, you've got the kingdom of what? Of heaven. Now, when we come to Revelation, this was Jesus' ministry. He leaves us in the care of the Holy Spirit and with the guidance of the spirit of prophecy in form of the apostles and the Old Testament, the law, the prophets, the whole canon of Scripture. And when we get to the time of Revelation, in 96 AD, Jesus decides, well, God decides, Okay, Jesus, it's time to reveal a fuller picture to our people. Because that whole, hey, there's going to be persecution for righteousness' sake, it's going to get pretty ugly, and they need to be prepared. And so Jesus says, I'm just waiting to reveal myself, so let me give this revelation to the angel. The angel says, woohoo, I'm going to take it down to the humans. He comes down to John on Patmos and says, John, you're separated from everyone you love. You're an outcast from everyone you love. You're a, you're a, you're a prisoner of the Roman Empire. But here is the greatest gift we could ever give you. Here is the revelation of Jesus Christ. John sees it and goes, whoa. We see it and we go, whoa, we're, we're called to sit with Jesus, that's where Jesus is trying to get us, sign me up. Jesus says, follow me. I'm going to lead you away from rebellion, away from those addictions, away from those problems. I'm going to lead you away from that so you're without fault as you stand before the throne of God. And we go, we're in. And so we become the servants of God. And then he says, now, I need you to do something. I need you to prophesy. I need you to teach. I need you to preach. I need you to proclaim to the whole world. That's where we're up to in Revelation chapter 11. When we get to chapter 12, the pedal hits the metal. Let's have a look. When we get to chapter 12, we are introduced to a very interesting problem. Here's our chapter map once again. And we've got all of our chapters overlaid on those key prophetic um, milestones. What I want to show you before we jump into chapter 12, uh, ch sorry, yeah, chapter 12, chapter 13, is this. Most Seventh-day Adventists or most Bible students are very aware that chapter 13 is a, is a problem chapter for the Christian, right? That's the place where we see the mark of the beast, right? But if you focused on that, and that's probably what most people focus on, you miss the point of the mark of the beast in the picture of the entire book. And I want to show and try and highlight that in light of what Jesus just taught us in the Gospels. Here's what I want to show you. I've just highlighted the key chapters in the time period that affect us. And I want you to notice something. In chapter 3, what is Jesus calling his followers to? To sit on his throne. In chapter 6, what are the, the, the lost crying out? Hide us from Christ's throne. This a throne is the symbol of power for the kingdom. Are you with me? So Jesus is calling his followers, come sit with me in my kingdom. 
But the lost go, hide us from his kingdom. It's too much for us to bear. When you get to chapter 10, which we looked at yesterday, the last command of that great mighty angel is, you need to prophesy again, teach this again, take this to many kings. What do kings represent? Kingdoms. Then we get down to chapter 11, and in the last part of that, we read it yesterday, there's a proclamation under the seventh trumpet that says, the kingdoms of this world have become what? The kingdom of our God. There's a change in the kingdom. So in the first couple of chapters, there are still two kingdoms at play. There are those who are in the kingdom of this world. There are those who are in the kingdom of Christ. And they're battling it out, so to speak. You get to the second coming, and it's clear that there are two kingdoms with two sets of subjects. One's lost and terrified, and one's excited and says, this is him. We've been waiting for him. And chapter 11 is where we see that declaration. Now, when you come to chapter 13, we see the establishment of a counterfeit kingdom to try and persuade the subjects to side with it over invite the invitation to God's kingdom. So this is really a kingdom battle happening here. That's chapter 13. But in verse 14, uh, sorry, in chapter 14, God goes, okay, I've got one last shot to present my case to invite the subjects of the kingdom of this world to become subjects in the kingdom of God. By the way, when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, how did he say you enter into the kingdom of God? What's the condition? What's the criteria? Be born again. The only way into God's kingdom is to be born into it. Again, not the first birth, the second birth. So now this, this good news, this gospel needs to go to all the world to give that last invitation for people to be, hey, I don't want to be in this kingdom that's doomed. I want to be in the kingdom of God. And so that invitation, hey, come join the kingdom. Then you get to chapter 15 and 16, and this is where we see the kingdoms judged in the form of the seven last plagues. It describes it exactly like that. Then you come to chapter 17, and we're told of a time in the not too distant future where all the kings of this world come together to try and create a one world system of kingdom. And they apparently are able to do it, but it doesn't last very long. As soon as they set it up, it's almost like the whole thing collapses, which is good news for us. And so God, through this revelation, he's showing us, listen, this is a fight between the last, this is the last stand between the last two kingdoms, mine and the kingdom of Satan and darkness. When you get to chapter 19, guess what happens? You can see it on the screen. The king comes. Amen. And then in chapter 21, 22, this is a little pun. In chapter, one and cha sorry, chapter 21, chapter 22, we have a new world. Amen. You can say it when you leave camp. That Robbie Bergen, he was teaching about the coming new world order and that we should be excited. Yeah, you should, because it's God's new world order. Amen. So that's where we're looking in Revelation. Jesus comes along and says, listen, I'm here. The kingdom of heaven is here. You're going to be persecuted for a while because there's two kingdoms fighting. Revelation is the epicenter of this battle. So he has spent those first 11 chapters trying to prepare his troops. Raise your hand if you're a troop this morning. You lazy bunch of people. Raise them. All of them. He's calling you to be a troop. And you might go, I'm not ready to fight. You don't have to fight. Give up fighting. Stop being a rebel and you're one of his number. All right, so let's get into it. The chiasm, we mentioned this yesterday. We have saw yesterday in chapter 10, we're introduced to the mission for God's people. God has got his people now. They've listened to the message of Laodicea. They're following wherever he leads them. They've got his character. They've got a mission. And the parallel is in chapter 14, which is the message. We know that because the mission is to the same people that in chapter 14, the message is going to. Does that make sense? So we are the vehicle, we are those messengers carrying the message to the people. That's our mission. And we saw that clarity from the spirit of prophecy yesterday, which said that the first, second and third angels' messages are the only thing that should absorb our attention. Amen? Oh, come on now. So 
We go to chapter 11, we have our two witnesses for God. Chapter 13, we have our two beasts, which are for Satan. And right in the epicenter of the epicenter of the book of Revelation is war. And that's what we want to unpack now, chapter 12. When we jump to chapter 12, we find something remarkable. The chiasm doesn't stop at the chapter level, it starts going right down to the verses. So in chapter, one, sorry, chapter 12, verse 1, we see an amazing sign in heaven, it's a woman. And a woman represents God's people in Bible prophecy. When you get to the last verse of the chapter, we have, uh, in verse 17, we have a woman on the earth. So we have this, 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 this church, the church of God up there in heaven, the church of God is now on the earth. When we go down to the next layer, in verse 4, we see the great red dragon somehow, in his political argument, convincing a third of the angels to side with him in this battle against God. On the other side of the chiasm, in verse 9, we see that the, the dragon is making war on the earth towards God's church. When we zoom in even further to verse 7 and verse 8, we get the famous passage, which you're all familiar with, I'm sure, which says, and there was war in heaven. And this is the epicenter of the epicenter. Michael is fighting with his angels against the dragon and his angels. They're fighting. And the word there in Greek gives the connotation of politics. It's a war of words, a war of ideas. And the idea is, is that God is unfair or God is fair. God is just, God is unjust. God's character, his law is right, it's wrong. That's the center of it to simplify it. And at the core of all of that is worship. And so from that, if we work backwards, because of the war in heaven, we end up with war on earth. And that's two different stages of time, as we'll see in a second. And as a result of that, we have this battle between God's people or his church and what's happening with Satan and his angels. That's, that's a very simplistic, high level view of it. Now, let's break it down this way. I want you to imagine this chapter 12, chapter 13 and chapter 14. These three chapters together are what I call the war plan. This is what God is giving us as intel on how this war between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan is going to actually go down. This is it. All the rest of Revelation was trying to persuade you to give up your rebellion and become a follower of Jesus. And hopefully we responded to Laodicea's message, the message to the, um, for the 144,000, the message in Revelation 9 with the sixth trumpet, the mes message in Revelation 10, the call to understand this, this sweet experience and understand the bitter disappointment, but then have the passion to know we are on the right ground now, so go and do the job of the mission. So hopefully that's who you are, because if that's not who you are, this is terrifying. Are you with me? For me, this is exhilarating because I know who my captain is of both my salvation, my mission, and the end game. And this thrills the pants off me. You can sit there and shudder in your boots and I, I feel sorry for you. But maybe that's because you don't know who Jesus is. You think you have it all sorted out. You're increased with goods and in need of nothing, but don't realize that you're what? Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. If that's you, you need to do three things. Jesus, give me your faith. Jesus, give me your righteousness. Jesus, illuminate my understanding through the gift of prophecy to see my condition. So that's what I'm assuming now. That's why I told you the most important thing in Revelation is Laodicean message. So now that we're here, what's Jesus want to reveal? Let's have a look. Let's go to chapter 12. We're going to focus in here just for a second, and we're going to spend the rest of our time on chapter 13. Um, for the lack of time, I'm going to just tell you the points, all right? But I encourage you to read this. By the way, I didn't mention this. Tomorrow, at the end of the presentation, I'm going to give you a screen link that will let you download all of my slides. Okay, so everything that's been here, you can download it, do what you want with it, all right? Wow, okay, cool. Now, so you can get the, the more notes, is what I'm trying to say. Well, when I say notes, it's only what you see, because that's all I have. Okay, so here's what I want to do. You can follow along in your Bible if you have it, all right? But I'm just going to tell you, because I've only got 30 minutes left. 
in verse 7, we have the war. That's the epicenter of the chapter, epicenter of the book. You with me so far? All right, the war's in heaven. So we're going to follow the chiasm down from that side to verse 17. Here we go. And I did it again. Okay, here we go. That's verse 7. When you come down to verse 14, it says that God has now prepared the woman a place in the wilderness, right? You're following your Bible. If not, you know it already and you're just going along with a review here. When the Bible says that he, she was prepared a place for 1260 days or 42 months or three and a half years, there's different ways the Bible renders it, we're essentially talking about the 1260 years of papal supremacy. This is the Dark Ages. This is the time from 538 to 1798 that the people of God are being persecuted. You with me so far? So that's verse 14. What I'm trying to show you is there's a, there's a linear progression of time from verse 7 to verse 17. So verse 7 was in heaven. I have no idea of the date of that, all right? Let's just go with a long time ago. The next, there's other events like the birth of Jesus and so on, but I'm going to jump down to the, the key prophecies. We've got 1260, the woman in the wilderness. So that's verse 14. When we come to verse 15, it says, and the earth. In fact, look at your Bible very carefully in verse 15. It says, and the earth did what? Maybe I'm reading the wrong part of the verse 15. What's it say in verse 15? Oh, sorry. Yes, 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 yes. And, and, the drag, and the serpent opened up his mouth and spewed out a flood after the woman to carry her away by the flood, right? That's verse 15, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So notice here that the character that spews out the water is what? A serpent. Notice it's not the dragon that's in verse 7. Okay, you see the difference? Now, who is the dragon? It's Satan. How do you know? Because of verse 8, 7, 8, 9. It tells you. It tells you that the dragon is the devil. But it also tells us the dragon is the serpent of old. So in this passage, the, the devil has three titles or three names or three nicknames. He's the dragon, he's the devil, and he's the serpent. Are you with me? Why does the Bible make such a complicated discussion by giving him three different names in the same passage? It's really, really simple. Because I'm married, I understand this. Let me explain that. That sounds bad. I have the most amazing, and she'll hate it if she hears this, but I have the most amazing wife in the entire world. Sorry, guys, you missed out. I got it. Wow, no one supported me in that. All right. So my wife, sometimes I call her babe. And it's funny because my two-year-old daughter now goes, babe, babe. She's ain't learning to speak. And it's so funny hearing her say it. But sometimes I call my wife babe, short for baby. Uh, that's kind of weird when you really think about what we're saying. But anyway, it's kind of like it's, it's the cuteness factor, right? And then sometimes I might call her, hey, Becky. Her name's Rebecca. So I, sometimes I call her Becky. Other times I might call her sweetie. I have a whole range of different names I use with my wife. Do you guys? Oh, that's why you're unhappy. Because only three of you said yes. The rest of you are just going, um, uh, Mildred, I love you. You're missing out. Listen, get some nicknames happening for your spouse. All right. So th why do we use nicknames? It's really, really simple. Because each nickname we choose is representing an aspect of the person that we admire. Some of you use the word, I don't use the word honey. I'm not cool enough for that. But some people go, oh, honey, it's because they're sweet. Some of you go, hey, missus, get over here. That's because you are going to go to hell. But anyway. <laughs> You, we use different nicknames to describe different attributes, right? Sweetie, honey, cutie, whatever, right? So in the Bible, it's the same thing. Jesus is called the lamb for a reason, because he is innocent, but he was taken as a sacrifice. Jesus is also called the um, Emmanuel, which is God with us. Jesus is called King of Kings. Why? Because he is the King of Kings. Jesus has got a whole range of different names. He's, he's, the, he's the Rock. He's the, the Rose of Sharon. There's a whole bunch of names representing different things. The devil is the same. He's the devil. He's described as the dragon when he is destructive with power and persecution and might. But he's described as a serpent when he uses deception, not not, not might. So notice this, in verse 
7, he's the dragon. When we get down to verse 15, he's the serpent. And out of his mouth is coming a flood. What's water represent in the Bible? Revelation specifically? Multitudes. So there's multitudes of people coming out of the mouth of the deceptive serpent. What, is, um, what does it represent, something coming out of the mouth? Jesus tells us. He says, whatever's in your heart is revealed when you open your mouth. So this serpent, who's the deceiver, he opens his mouth up and casts out lots and lots of different people for the purpose of carrying away the church with deception. So for the 1260 years, he's a dragon fighting the church, persecuting the church. That doesn't work so well. So at the end of that 1260, there is a counter-reformation to the Reformation initiated by Jesuits and the Catholics and all that good stuff. And they start introducing a whole range of deceptive teachings again to the Protestant Reformation. And so now Protestants are doing things that are not biblical, but they're still being... Yeah, anyway, you get the point. So let's continue on. I'm running out of time. That's verse 15. So verse 16, it says something amazing in this passage. It says, and the earth, what? Helped the woman who was about to be carried away by the flood. Okay, you're all Bible students. In Revelation chapter 13, the next chapter in verse 11, it says, and I saw another beast rising up out of the earth. What was the earth? Where is the earth? Are we talking about the planet? No, we're talking about a place that's opposite to the populated spaces of the old world, the sea. So we're talking about geographically North America. That's what we're saying in chapter 13. But here in verse 16, it says, listen, after the 1260 years, so that ends in 1798, there's a counter-reformation. Instead of trying to persecute God's people, now it's through deception, flood the churches with deceptive teachings. But as a result of that, God's like, I'm one step ahead of you. I'll prepare the earth. North America, and what happens? The people in the old world flee across to the earth, the new world. And that's how they escape the flood. This is around the 16, uh, from, from about the 1600s, about through to 1776, because that's when America becomes a nation, so to, see, so to speak. But we continue on now, we come to verse 17. So notice the, the pattern. We start in heaven in this side of the chiasm. We go down to the 1260. We come out of the 1260. And now we're moved from the old world. We're going to the new world. And we're trying to get away from all those errors of the old world, all that persecution of the old world. And then we come to verse 17. And now it says, and the dragon. Notice that? It just changed back. It was the dragon in verse 7, then it goes into the serpent through deception, and now the deception hasn't worked because the gospel's gone to all the world. And so now the dragon comes back. I'm angry. I'm wroth with who? The church and the remnant of the church. Now, there's a crazy notion going around that there's no remnant in Revelation. I don't care how smart you are, you're dumb if you don't think there's a remnant in Revelation. There's a remnant. And so it says here in chapter 12, verse 17, and the remnant are the object of that last battle. And then it describes them. Who have what? What are the two things? What are the two things? Keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Wow, that sounds just like the eye salve, the spirit of prophecy, testimony of Jesus, of Laodicea. And keeping the commandments of God sounds just like having the white robe of righteousness. So who are we talking about? Laodicea. So we now are expecting, according to Revelation chapter 12, somewhere, sometime in the new world, we're expecting a dragon to show up in the form of persecutive power against the Laodicean period of church history. Can you see why it's so important we got the Laodicean thing sorted out? Because if you're not sorted out there, you are in for a ride when we get to this period. So, what have we got now? When we come to chapter 12, verse 17, it ends with, went to make war. That's the theme. This is what God's trying to communicate. Now, if you were John, man, I feel for him. He's getting this, I believe, sort of sequentially. Not necessarily in one moment, I don't think. I don't know. I wasn't there. But let's just imagine for a second that he's sort of seeing the vision. He's writing it down. And he gets to verse 17. And he's like, yeah, and the dragon is enraged with the woman. Let's make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. 
Imagine if that's where the Bible stopped. How would you feel? Who wins? It doesn't look good for, for the, the commandment keepers and the testimony of Christ holders. So what happens here? The theme right there smack in the middle after Christ has prepared us and got us to this point is that we are looking to find ourselves in war. So here's chapter 12. So that's where it ends. It ends with war. So now the war plan is revealed in the course of chapter 13 and chapter 14. Chapter 13 is God's way that he, uh, sorry, chapter 13 is how the dragon is going to fight his side of the war. And chapter 14 is the way God is going to fight in the war. So these three chapters, chapter 12 is the big picture of why the war is there, what the war is over, where the war gets down to, the geographical location, all that good stuff. And chapter 13 is, right, now, let me show you how the devil's going to fight. Then chapter 14 is, right, you've seen that, and let me show you how I'm going to fight. So we're going to, we're going to finish chapter 14 tomorrow. That's what we're going to do tomorrow. Now we're going to jump into 13. So let's get into it. So in, we left in chapter 12, verse 17, with a time. This war that it's talking about has to be sometime after 1798, because the 1260 is finished. Um, we've gone into um, the new world. And so our location is the new world. The people of this time period are the Laodiceans. The enemy is the dragon, who is Satan. And it's interesting that it notices that it calls out the people who have two attributes, commandments of God and the gift of prophecy or testimony of Jesus. If the Bible says the dragon's going to make war with the people that have the commandments of God and testimony of Jesus, that's how the dragon knows who to fight against, which makes it a weapon in the war, commandments of God and testimony of Jesus. And it's interesting because in Revelation 13, the second beast is called the false prophet when you get to the end of Revelation, which is a false gift of prophecy, the false testimony of Jesus. So this is how chapter 12 leaves us. And so the big question is, what is the goal that Satan is trying to achieve with this war? It started in heaven, it comes all the way down, it gets to verse 17, we're in the new world, and we're after the 1260, all that stuff. But he's gone now to make his final attack, his final war against God's people. The question is, what's his goal? Why is he trying to make this last stand against God's people? Well, we zoom in here on Revelation 13, and we see it very, very clearly. The goal is that he will cause as many as would not worship. Then you jump down to verse 17, that there's this, this key to try and force people, this mark to try and force people into what? Worship. So the central issue of this war from Satan's perspective is he wants your worship. And remember back in Laodicea, what are we? Lukewarm? What's that? We're a bit righteous or loyal to the kingdom of God, but we're also in rebellion to the kingdom of God, which means we're loyal to Satan. That's why Jesus says, listen, you're in my mouth right now. I get it that you're struggling with all this stuff, but let me tell you how to get over that stuff so I can get you out of that condition. But I can't hold on to someone who is loyal to Satan and loyal to me at the same time. Because the ultimate loyalty to Satan is worship. So that's, that's the end game here. So the question is, who wins? Now, I'm going to take you on a rapid fire. You think I've been talking fast up till now? This is nothing. We're going to go fast now because I've got something I really, really want to share with you and I'm running out of time. I want to take you to a book that I have written by Thomas Friedman. Thomas Friedman is an American political commentator. He is not a Christian, as far as I know. And his book is not religious. He wrote a book in the 1990s called The Lexus and the Olive Tree, and it's a book on what we call today globalization. And he looks at how the world from a political commentator's perspective in the 1980s to the 1990s, things are happening in the world and we are going down a really one-way road from his perspective in the early 1990s. So he writes in this book, I'll summarize it for you with three points. He says, there are three things that I can see happening in the world today. Again, 1990s. 
He says, if these three things continue, we will find ourselves in an economic, a global um, community, which he called a global village, but today we would call it globalization. So he's kind of a leading thought father on globalization um, back in the day. So remember again, this is the 1990s this book was written. In his book, he says there are three factors that if they keep happening at the rate that he sees them happening in the 1990s, we will be in a global village. The first one he identifies is democratization of technology. Now, in the 1990s, early 1990s, when he wrote this book, something was happening. Technology was exponentially getting, um, well, faster, but also cheaper. And when I say cheaper, not by today's standards. In the 1980s, my grandfather bought a computer. It cost $11,000 a personal computer for his practice. He was working in, in Sydney. When it came to the early 1990s, he gave me that computer as a 10-year-old to play with, um, to practice coding and things on, and he went and bought another computer, and it cost him $5,000. And it was more powerful, it was better specs and all this stuff, but over the course of not even 10 years, the price had halved, and the technology was more powerful. And so what he was saying is, in the 1990s, there was sort of this... this uh, environment that things are going places with the tech space. Not to even be able to foretell what would happen in just five years from when this book was written. So he says, listen, as people, as, as we keep going down this path, more and more people will have access to technology. You remember in the 1990s, most of you didn't have computers. You didn't have phones, at least not these sorts of phones. And so he's saying, we're going on this path. We're all going to get more and more access to technology. And that will lead us to a globally connected village. Number two, he says there's also happening something strange in the 1980s, 1990s. There is a democratization of finances, which means that people are able to get money easier, as in like borrow money easier. My father uh, told me a story that when he bought his first house in the 1970s in Sydney, he had to take his bank manager, which he banked with his whole life, out to lunch to try and persuade them to give him a loan to buy his first house. You had to have a relationship with the people. Think about it today. Do you need to know the people you're borrowing money from? I don't, I don't understand how afterpay works. I get, I get no idea how that thing works. I guess the merchants are paying the fees or something. But how can you buy stuff, like walk into a shop and say, yeah, I'll pay you in four payments and I'll walk out with my thing. How is that possible? But anyway, that's the world we live in. And Thomas Friedman was saying, listen, with the advent of things like this PayPal, and that, which was in the early 1990s, and, and the way the credit card industry is going to get disrupted and loans and all this stuff, people are going to get access to money to do what? Buy the technology. Have we seen that happen in the last 20 or so years? I have been to countries that would be considered like developing countries and they have got, I've met people where they're living in, in houses that we wouldn't consider houses and yet they've got the latest smartphone. Their priorities, I don't know if that's how that works over there, but the technology is now accessible to most people on planet Earth and as a result, that technology and that access to finances has connected us. The third and final driving factor he identifies in the 1990s is that we are moving to a point where everyone will have access to information. The internet was just sort of in the early advent of it in the 1990s, and um, I think by what, when he wrote this book, MySpace wasn't even developed, which was the precursor to all the social media stuff. Look where we are today. We live in a world now where you can watch the, the, the news, the sports, whatever you're into, in real time on the other side of the planet. We have access to info. If something, like I was presenting at another place the other day and there was the earthquake in Turkey happened, while it was happening, someone was telling us in the congregation, hey, right now, breaking alert, it's happening right now. Like that was unheard of in the 1990s. And so Thomas Friedman makes this point. He says, listen, as we, as we see these three things develop, more faster technology, more accessible technology, more funds to buy the technology, there'll be more sharing of information. And then he says, if that gets to a, a, a point, we will be a globally connected village. And then he says this, if this happens, I have two fears. Here's his two fears in his book, Lexus and the Olive Tree. Number one, my fear is, he says, that if this happens, we become a globally connected village through technology, money, and through information, there will be an opportunity for global economic control. He wrote that in the 1990s. He's not a prophet. He's not a Christian. He's just a smart dude. And he says, listen, if we go down this path, which I believe we are at 
we're at the end of the path to some extent. His concern was we could have global economic control of an individual or a group of people. The second fear he poses in his book, he says, I think there'll be a real possibility of a global economic collapse. Now, he wrote that, as I said, in the 1990s. In less than 10 years, or just on 10 years later, the GFC hit. And, you know, for some of you, you went out and bought LCD TVs with your $700 stimulus package or whatever it was. But we got off light in Australia. I mean, other parts of the planet where they're still trying to recover, and now they're hit with all the stuff that's happening now, which leads us to the, the COVID scenario. In the first quarter of 2020, because of COVID, because of all the interconnectedness and the shipping supplies and all that stuff, the ASX lost 24%. In the first quarter, there was hardly even COVID in Australia. And yet, because of all the globalization and interconnectedness, we got hit pretty bad. So, what's the point of this? Let's recap chapter 13. In chapter 13, we have three characters. We have the dragon, we have the sea beast, and we have the land-like beast. These three characters play out Satan's war plan. In fact, the dragon is the symbol for Satan himself. In the passage, Satan is the architect. He designs how this war is going to be played out. It's going to be played out in three phases, as you will see in the book of Revelation in chapter 13. But he's the designer. He's the, the puppet master. He's pulling the strings behind the scene. When, when anything happens in terms of worship in this story, as you will see, the worship comes to him, even though he's not the front man. He's the architect. Does that make sense? So then we jump down to the sea beast. He's the first real character we see in chapter tw uh, uh, 13. In verse 1, it says this beast comes up out of the sea. He's called a sea beast because he comes out of the sea. Sea represents many, many peoples, nations, tongues, all that stuff. And then you have this composite beast which has a body of Greece. The leopard represents Greece. So human reasoning and philosophy. It has feet of a what? Of a bear. Bear was Medo Persia. Medo Persia was known for its infallibility. When you pass a law, the law can never be changed because the law is perfect. So you have a system that's based on human reasoning and human logic of the Greeks. It walks in the order of Medo Persia that it's infallible. When it speaks, it's infallible. But then it has the mouth of a lion, and the lion was Babylon. And when lions spoke, or when Babylon spoke, it was you bow and worship or you burn. And worship the image, by the way. You worship the image. Remember Daniel chapter 3, right? You worship that image or you burn. And so when this mouth speaks, it's speaking Babylonian um, character, but it's walking in the body of humanism of Greek and it's got the infallibility of Medo-Persia. But all of its power comes from the dragon who is Satan himself. All right, that's our sea beast. The sea beast is actually the puppet the puppet for the dragon. He's the front man. When people think that they're worshipping, they're worshipping the front man, and the front man gives that worship back to the beast, uh, to the dragon. That's sort of how that works. So then we have the land beast in verse 11. The land beast is um, the muscle. He's the, the hired help in the story. He's the one that's going to force the people to go along with the sea beast, who is ultimately giving the worship to the dragon. Sounds confusing, I know, but it's not that confusing. So, when we come down and zoom into that passage again, I want you to notice something. At the end of the, the this is the muscle, this is the, the land beast. He says, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead, that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. By the way, I didn't say this, and in case someone accuses me of not being bold enough to say it, I'll say it. The dragon is Satan, the sea beast is the papal power, and the land beast is the United States. All right, And I can show you why another time, but I don't have time in the next couple of minutes I've got left. Here's verse 17. I want you to notice this. That no one may what? Buy or sell except the one who has the mark. Watch this. There are three words in that passage. No one, buy or sell, or accept. I'm going to give you, at the sake of time, I was going to ask you, but I'll just give it to you. There are synonyms for each of those words. Watch this. When the Bible says that no one will be able to buy or sell, it's actually referring to everyone. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but when the Bible says nobody on the planet will be able to buy or sell, it's actually talking about something that will affect everybody. So that's global. And then it says buy or sell. Buying or selling is economic. 
So now we have a global situation that's dealing with economics, and the word there, except, is dun, 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 control. If I say, you can go into that line, uh, except the people that don't have that shirt, what I'm doing is I'm controlling you. I'm controlling the masses. And so Revelation 13, the second beast, is essentially the agency through which global economic control will be introduced. Now, do you remember Thomas Friedman in the 1990s? He said, wow, something's happening in our world. We're getting more technology, more access to money, and more information. Hey, if we continue down this path, I have a real concern. We're going to end up in a time where we might be globally, economically controlled. I suggest this morning that we are in that world right now, and I want to prove it to you. To have global economic control, there are two things that you will need. You will need a global financial system, and you will need a controllable currency system. In order to have global monetary control, you have to have a whole system planetarily that is connected with money. Short version of this story is, that happened in 1999 the global financial system. I could tell you the story, but I don't have time. Trust me, that's there. I'll prove it to you. Anybody been overseas? Have you used your Australian ATM card overseas? Yes. Yeah, that's the proof that's there. That happened in 1999. So now the question is, if that's already happened, then has this happened? Obviously not. Is this happening? The answer is yes. Will that be a reality? The answer is absolutely. And you say, you are a conspiracy theorist. Really? You sit down and buckle up your seat because we're going on a really fast ride. Here we go. Number one, global financial system, controllable currency. Here we go. I've been tracking this for the last 20 years. Here's just a, a recent cap of this. In 2018, this was a pinnacle year for a controllable currency on the planet. Every major country in 2018 was talking about going down this, what they call cashless route, all right? In 2018, Sydney Morning Herald says, cashless future is here. This is 2018. With coins and banknotes becoming niche. You read the whole article, basically what it's saying is, is that, hey, we're noticing a trend. People are using tap and go a whole lot more than cash. That's the point of the article, all right? No big deal, but it's saying, listen, if you own coins and notes, it might have a niche market very, very soon. We continue, July 2018, New Daily. It says, the Austra Australia's path to a cashless society is accelerating and what? Inevitable. All right, let's keep going. ABC News, uh, what is that, 2018, I can't, November, I think it is. Watch this. Regulators are pushing us into a cashless world as the Reserve Bank of Australia declares a turning point has been reached. This is 2018, okay? Now, what, has, what happened in 2018 is the Reserve Bank of Australia said, hmm, this FPOS system that we have, it's getting outdated. We need to replace it with something called the NPP, the New Payment Platform. They announced this in 2018. In fact, they have, a, have an article for it. So the Reserve Bank of Australia, 2018, November, they announced our journey towards a near cashless payment system is the introduction of the NPP. When you use FPOS, by the way, in 2018, they announced it would be operational in 2020. So when you started tapping from 2020 onwards, your transactions are going through the NPP now, not the old FPOS network. The networks are, it's the same terminals from your perspective, but the whole back end is completely being redesigned. And that's what he's announcing in 2018. So then we move on. We come to 2019. It says the rise of a cashless society sees coin sales plummet for the Royal Australian Mint. Okay, that's no big deal. We're all going tap and go. And so the Mint's going, hey, we don't actually have a demand for cash anymore, printing of coins anymore. So then, oh, skip that one. Ah, oh, don't you hate that? Hang on. This is because some of you didn't take your picture fast enough. All right, next one. There we go. So Sydney Morning Herald in 2020 in February, so this is, this is right when COVID starts to become a thing in Australia. This is around the time that the toilet paper thing started happening, okay? That's how we reckon time now, by toilet paper. The business appeal of a tap and go and the end of cash. In the article, it talks about this, that um, businesses are going, hey, you know what? We think that if we use cash only, we will stop having our staff rip us off and take money out of the till. So let's go cashless. That was the argument in, in February in 2020 in this article. It continues on. I'll be careful which thing I'm hitting here. 
So coronavirus hits, and now they start publishing things like this. Coronavirus could speed up the introduction of a cashless society. Why? Because coronavirus travels on the notes and the coins. That was the argument. ABC comes out in 2020 and says, coronavirus fears mean shops are accepting card payments only. Is this the end of cash? Wow, it's a really good health initiative to get rid of cash to make sure no one gets COVID. Sydney Morning Herald continues on and says, the coronavirus will accelerate the trend towards a cashless society. This is April 2020. All right. Then um, the Euro Money magazine publishes in uh, April 2020, cashless over COVID-19. So this starts, starts rippling around the planet. All the big economies around the world are starting to say, hey, COVID's created a really interesting opportunity, an opportunity to get rid of cash. So we continue on. Forbes magazine on 20th of, 24th of March, 2020. So you know how we had like a stimulus package here for the people who are affected by COVID? The US had the equivalent and they had to put that bill through to the Senate to get it approved so they could pay out the Americans that needed the payments. But in the bill that was submitted to the Senate, someone actually read it. And in the bill, there was a clause that the payment would only be given in digital dollars to a digital wallet. When that got leaked, everyone freaked, because you know Americans, they like to freak out about their rights and things, unlike <laughs> us, we just go, yeah, all right, cool, we'll do it. <laughs> and then it was taken out, and the bill passed without the digital dollar part of it. So then Forbes comes along just a couple of days later and says, well, actually, should our societies go cashless? Maybe that's the right thing to do. Then they come back a couple of days later after that and say, hey, forget that uh, digital dollar and the stimulus bill, the euro dollar is coming, the digital euro dollar is coming. Because the EU now decides, hmm, maybe we should get on this bandwagon. Now, by the way, China had already announced its plans to go down a digital yuan route a year before this. And so it's starting to heat, it, heat up these digital dollars. So then we go Fortune magazine, and they say why the US should not let China dominate the digital currency race. The, basically, the problem is, is that right now, all the, country, all the central banks of all the world, as you will see, they are all racing to be the first to finalize and roll out a digital currency because they want to be the standard in the digital race. The way the US dollar is kind of the standard for the fiat race, they want the digital currency to replace the, the US. So now we go to Washington Times. This is also 2020. The US dollar could be dethroned by internationally by digital currency. This is the great fear that starts. This is 2020. So while we're all worried about our six feet apart or whatever it is, and, and we're worried about, oh, there's only five people out in this room. And oh, well, while we're all focusing on all that stuff, this is what's happening in the world. It's all happening right under our noses. Sydney Morning Herald picks up in 2022 February. End of the dollar as we know it. The Reserve Bank of Australia suggests digital tokens or digital currency are on the money. All right, this is where it gets really super exciting as a follower of Jesus. In April, uh, sorry, August 2022, not too long ago, future of money, the Reserve Bank of Australia to trial a one Digital currency. They announced it. Did you hear about it? No, I didn't think you would, but it was announced. In December, so that was August, now we're in December, the Reserve Bank of Australia concerns over the impact of banks, on banks, I should say, after the Aussie central bank digital currency rollout. I want you to notice what, this, what they say in that highlighted paragraph there. It says, the Reserve Bank of Australia believes, this is the CBDC, which is the digital currency that they're testing, the Reserve Bank of Australia believes that it will replace the Australian dollar, ultimately avoiding commercial banks fully. Why? Because you have to understand something. A digital currency doesn't, isn't something that you have and then you give it to your bank and they hold it for you and then they give it back to you, you give it to this merchant and then you get this product. The digital currency sits in a wallet that sits at the Reserve Bank of the country. You don't need to have a Commonwealth Bank, or uh, NAB, or any of these other banks. Your money sits with an address at the Reserve Bank. And when you give money to this, current, to this shop, they get the money and they just change who that money belongs to at the Reserve Bank. There is no need for commercial banks. So in December last year, in, as they're doing this trial, the trial's running right now as we're talking. 
in the middle of the trial, they go, oh, we have a concern that this might actually impact the commercial banks in Australia. Poor banks. That's how they've framed the article. Anyway, let's continue. So now we're in March 2023. When was this? Last month. Digital currencies tested by the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, the ANZ Bank, as the Reserve Bank of Australia seeks to stave off the threat of what? Cryptocurrency. Now cryptocurrency is the bad man in the room and we need to have a digital currency that's operated by the Reserve Banks of our countries to get rid of that threat. Do you know how many people use cryptocurrency? Like 0.0000 of the population. But it's such a threat, we need to look at digital currencies. Yeah, interesting. This is Decrypt Magazine, February 2023. Japan announces the launch of a new central bank digital currency pilot this April. It started this month. They trialed it. Uh, Fortune Crypto, is a, it's a Fortune Magazine, but a crypto part of it. And it says central bank currencies are coming whether you want them or not. Should we be worried about digital currencies? That's the point of the article. This magazine published uh, in the end of 2022 is an interview with the federal chairman of the Reserve Bank in the United States. And he confirmed, or she confirms, that the US, that a US central bank digital currency would not be anonymous. That means every transaction you make is tracked. That's the whole point of a digital currency. It is controllable. I took this today off the, uh, the central bank tr um, digital currency tracking website. So there's a website that's tracking the projects and the progress of all the countries around the world, the, the, the reserve banks of all the world, and how they are going and treating digital currency. You can see that if they're green, they're currently in what they're calling the research stage. Australia started their research stage in August last year. We're in it. The Reserve Bank is testing it with our big four banks. You can see that the US is in the research stage. Um, there's a few countries in research. Proof of concept is the next step. Now they actually put it to market as a proof of concept. Let's test it out with a limited trial. When you look at that one, wow, look at that. Brazil is in proof of concept mode. Um, Russia is in proof of concept mode. And uh, various other countries. New Zealand, proof of concept mode. The next stage after that is the pilot. China has been in this pilot mode, and their pilot is something in the order of about 20 million people that are using the digital yuan. Their currency is tied directly to the reserve bank of that country, and every transaction is connected to their tokens. That's what we're, we're two steps away from that here in Australia. And the blue is launched. They're actually using it. And the, you can't quite see it on this map, but it's these, um, these Central American Caribbean nations. There are a number of um, countries there that are actually using digital currencies issued by their reserve banks. So here's where it's heading. All the information that I have read is all leading to the fact that most of these countries who are now in the proof of concept stage, they are hoping to have it rolled out by 2025. That's the plan. Now, will that mean everyone will be cashless in 2025? Probably not. But that's when the goal is, is to make it, that's the new technology everyone we're using. The way you all started using QR codes only two years ago, when they've been around for like 50, you started using them. Now everyone knows how to use them. Well, digital currency will be the same way. So when we come back to Revelation, here's my point. We are told that there will be a time where there will be global economic control. That would have been impossible in your grandparents' lifetime. And I know you say, oh, but my grandparents believed Jesus was coming. Yeah, they did, with the information they had available. And their parents and their parents and their parents. I'm so sick and tired of hearing that argument. Get with the program. 1999 was the first time that the whole planet was connected monetarily for the financial system. And now we are about at two to three years till the whole planet has a controllable currency. And it will be different currencies. I don't think we're going to have one international standard, but it doesn't matter. It's digital. Once we go down that path, it's controllable. And so we are looking at our time in Revelation, in human history, in the very near future. By the way, I'm not date setting, so please don't leave here going, you know. I heard someone saying that Jesus is coming or Sunday Law is coming in 2027. I don't know. I don't care. Not my problem. 
All I'm saying is that this stuff's reality. It's not fiction. It's not conspiracy theory. We are living in the time Revelation was written for. So go back to Laodicea and ask Jesus, where's your rebel? Let's pray. Father in heaven, this is exciting stuff. To think that in 96 AD, you revealed to your people a time that there would be technology possible to accomplish something that has never been done in human history. And when we see this stuff, sometimes you can get a bit sensational and you, you're all about the newspaper articles and things, but we have been focusing on Jesus in Revelation. Jesus is calling us, he's working our hearts. Even now, some of us here are still rebels. And he wants to get that out of us and, and give us his righteousness and his faith and his eye salve. And he wants us to be prepared to sit on his throne. But he also wants us to be awake and understand that we are in a war between two kingdoms. They've got their weapons and we've got ours. And we'll talk about that tomorrow. But Father, please... Encourage us and strengthen our faith to be bold for Jesus because he was bold for us. Father, bless my friends here as we continue our journey here at Big Camp. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful afternoon.